upon the water. The Spirit of the Lord hovers over the stream. The Son of God is named Beloved. And all who worship shout out, Glory! with songs of wonder and awe. Your voice sweeps away all the boundaries between us. Your voice reminds us that we are precious, esteemed, beloved. Even so, we often live as if they have not changed us. Forgive us, us Spirit, Spirit of Grace. Remind, remind us again that in the water of our, our baptism, we stand, stand with Jesus. Jesus and hear your affirming voice. May your grace become our gratitude that we reveal in deeds, following Jesus in paths of justice, right relationship, and peace. Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. As a voice from heaven said to Jesus, so God says to each of us, you are my beloved child, and with you, I am well pleased. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Alleluia. in the temple, and now out to the edge of the wilderness at the river of Jordan, where one last prophet has started his ministry. Listen for the word of the Lord for you in Luke 3, verses 1 through 22. In the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was the governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip was ruler of the region of Eritrea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways made smooth and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. 
John said to the crowds that had come out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able to raise from these stones children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, well, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed to you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by false threats, threats or false accusation. And be satisfied with your wages. As the people, people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning God, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong in his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the ruler, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, and because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them all by shutting John up in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus had also been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form, like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, saying, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you, I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the, what, 15 or so days since we sang Silent Night, Jesus has gone from a newborn king to a toddler honored by Magi and hunted by Herod and is now a grown man being baptized. But before he tells us about Jesus' baptism, Luke takes a little time to connect John's ministry to the work of the prophets who had come before, in particular, Elijah and Isaiah. Luke also uses the setting of this portion of the story to reinforce the history of the relationship with, between God and the people of Israel. See, John has chosen a spot along the Jordan for his place of ministry. The river that all those generations ago was their point of entry into promised land. When we overlay John's preaching with John's location, we see that God's ongoing promise goes way beyond land. God released the Hebrew people from captivity as they walked out of Egypt through the Red Sea and into the wilderness. And God used the next 40 years in the wilderness to continue that liberating work. They learned in the wilderness how to follow God spiritually by obeying the laws that they were given and literally by picking up and moving again and again and again and again. <laughs> Until finally, all that separated them from this new home was a river. A river that was overflowing its banks. But God made a way, again parting the water. And then they were home, settled. But in many ways, they were never satisfied with all those blessings that God provided. 
By the time we get through the time of the judges, the time of the kings, the time of the exile, the time of their return, the people in John's time, in Jesus' time, they were in need of another crossing over. They needed a reminder that their king was God and that their kingdom, their promised land, was still available to them right where they are. But in order to see, in order to be ready for that revelation, they needed to get wet again. They needed to prepare themselves, not for a place, but for a person. They needed to hear the words first from John and then from Jesus himself that they were God's people, God's children, that they were beloved, that they were made to be loved, that they were made to be loved. John preaches out there on the edge of the wilderness that the primary meaning behind the law is love. Love for God, love for neighbor, and love of self. Gritty, hardworking, sacrificial love. The sort that demonstrates how mercy and justice are a huge part of walking faithfully and humbly with God. Listen again to God, John's call to confess and to act. In verse 8, he tells the crowd they must bear fruits worthy of repentance. Produce fruit that shows you have changed your hearts and your lives. Words are not enough. Prayers are not enough. Knowing your family history and tracing your roots all the way back to Abraham and Sarah, that's not enough. As Lerner and Lowe have Eliza sitting in my fair lady, don't talk of love, show me. Show love, be love in very practical ways. Here's how it works. Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. John strikes me as the kind of guy who would have said, it ain't rocket science or brain surgery. Share what you have. Live in a way that assures that no one must go without. A way that assures that no one is alone. The tax collectors and soldiers, those who had chosen to be or found themselves with no other viable option other than to be in the employ of those who oppressed and harassed their own people, when they asked what they were to do, John had the same answer. Show love. Be love in very practical ways. Don't take more than you're required. Don't line your own pockets with money taken unjustly. Don't cheat people. Don't harass them. Live and work justly. These weren't new ideas in John's time. Fully a third of the Bible is made up of the words of the prophets who came before John all of them calling the people to repent. Calling the leaders and the people to live and love as God commands. So no, this isn't a new teaching. Any more than we would consider them new today. We'll hear Jesus say similar words over and over and over again as we continue through Luke's Gospel. They are words we hear throughout Paul's letters and the other epistles. They are the ideas that countless preachers and teachers, smarter and better at preaching and teaching than I'll ever be, have offered in the century since. And yet, here we are, in this day and age, especially those of us who claim to be followers of Christ, standing in as deep a need of confession and repentance as those brood of vipers that John saw standing before him. We stand in need of an infusion of justice in our culture. We have fallen hard for the allure of wealth. We struggle to resist the temptation of building just a little more cushion for ourselves, of being sure that we have more than plenty before assuring that others even have enough. And yes, I'm preaching to myself here. It's much easier to hear the reminder that I am God's beloved than to act 
on the reminder that I am to be love. Because to exert the force of God's love in this world, the love that stands in line just like everybody else waiting for a baptism, the love that quietly confesses and powerfully blesses, the love that spends itself completely for the sake of the others, the love that was broken and poured out for you, for me. That love is countercultural. And it gets people's attention, and not in a good way. At least not in the way that we've been conditioned by custom and habit to see as good and proper. Friends, I, I have never ever claimed to be a prophet. And I can't say that I've heard God's voice more than a couple times in my life. But I can see and say with great certainty, now is the time for the body of Christ God's church to bear fruit. Now is the time for those of us who know that we are loved to love God and love our neighbors as though our lives depend on it. Because the truth is, our spiritual lives do depend on it. We must deepen our connection with God and strengthen our bonds with one another as we do so. And then we must look beyond ourselves to see those out there, those others who need an infusion of that love. For some, this means making sure they have clothes that are warm and clean. For others, a hot meal offered with no strings attached. But many others are in need of the fruit that is less tangible. Showing love also means advocating on behalf of those who are being treated unjustly by those in power at the local, state, and national levels. Showing love means taking a stand against corruption that allows corporations to have more influence than people. Showing love requires us to confess our prejudices and begin to build friendships across racial and economic lines. Committing to the kind of work that can transform someone's life. That is a step toward justice that just might change the world. That is what it means to be love in the world. That is what we are called to do. To be. On this day, when we recall the baptism of our Lord, remember, beloved, be loved, be love. the Lord's table, if you haven't yet done so, press pause, go get yourself something like a cracker or a piece of bread and some juice or wine or something similar so that you and your household might participate in the Lord's Supper. Friends, in this time of pandemic and temporary separation, we continue to worship and to gather around the table. It's different to be sitting in many places with our own supplies. We are bound together, not through proximity, but by bits and bites and cables. 
More importantly, we are bound to one another by faith in the connecting, loving power of the risen Christ who meets us where we are, working within us and through us, maybe especially now. This table, all of our tables that we gather around, belong to Christ. The meal that we will take is hosted by Christ, and so all who seek to live by the values of God's way are welcome to join as we eat together from a distance. Be sure that your table is set and listen again to these familiar words of instruction and promise. On the night before he died, Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Eat this bread and remember me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant sealed in my blood. Drink this cup and remember me. After he rose from the dead, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go and make disciples of all people, baptizing them in the name of the triune God, and teach them my commandments. And remember, I am with you always. We are ready to join this meal of remembrance, of communion, of hope. Let us break bread together. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We lift up, lift up your hearts. We, we lift, lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It, it is, is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for your saving love poured out in human history, the blessing of your word and spirit at creation, the deliverance of your people through the sea, and the way your justice rolls down like water the river of life that flows from your throne. We give you thanks and praise, O God, for Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, how he poured out his life in love for the world through the baptism of his death and resurrection, how he feeds and fills us with his body and blood through the bread and cup we share in his name. Now pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, to transform us for your service through the gospel of salvation through the font of new creation, through the feast of our redemption, until your realm of glory comes. We give you thanks and praise, O God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, in the unity of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior Jesus Christ has taught us, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus said, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Out of the believer's heart, living waters shall flow. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever believes in me will never thirst. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Shall we eat and drink together? As you have water in your worship space, I invite you to remember you too are wet. We have returned to the font. We have broken the bread. 
We have poured the drink. We have shared a meal together. Even while we remain physically separated, we have been united in our souls. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for making us one. One in the body, the spirit, the Lord. One in the faith and baptism we share. May our lives joyfully display our hope in you, sent out as one people in your service. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. save this water and I invite you to take some of the water that you had in your bowl today and put it in a little jar, label it, set it aside, and then bring it back out when we worship week by week. Because you know the thing is, one of these days we will gather together in this space again and we will bring that water into one font. And remember together that we are one body. We've remembered much today. <laughs> and the world would have us forget just how much it all means. Stay wet, my friends, swimming in God's delight over you. Be filled, dear ones, letting the feast that we shared nurture your spirit. For there are children of God everywhere you will go, who need to see the light of Christ in you, in us. Go in peace.